kids that were here this week, and I'm really grateful for Clint Taylor, does a great job, and uh, it was wonderful. We had VBS, and then Performing Arts Camp, and then we have Basketball Camp. The kids did such an amazing job. Um, it was great to, uh, uh, great to see them and uh, perform and do all the stuff that they do. They did a wonderful job. So, hey, if you are new to our church in the last you know, few weeks, the last month or so, um, we want to invite you to lunch today. We're going to do, we do this every six weeks at El Pollo Grill. So you can sign up on our app or on our website. And if this is your first time here today, you can join us today if you'd like. My wife and I would love to meet you, get to know you. There are a lot of other people going, so it's not just going to be a one-on-one thing. So don't worry about that. Uh, we don't buy it anyways, but some people think we do. So, um, but anyway, so we've got that going on and, uh, um, We're going to do that again every six weeks. So if you miss, you can join us for the next one. So we're in a series right now called This Is My Bible. And we began in January with the book of Genesis. We're going to end in December with the book of Revelation. And what we're doing is we're going through a different book of the Bible every single week. And so if you're new here, what we're doing is we're taking like a mountaintop look at every single book of the Bible. And it's been a crazy journey. It's been an interesting journey. We're asking you to do a few things. We're asking you to bring your Bible to church every single week. We're asking you to read your Bible every single day, even if it's just one verse. And then for many of you, you've entered in on this journey where you're gonna read the Bible through in a year with us. As you walked in, in your um, brochures you received when you walked in, you received one of these on the inside. It is an overview. These are basically cheat sheets for every single book. And if you missed out on some of these, you can go to thisismybible.io they're on that website. You can download them, screenshot them, whatever you want. But this kind of gives you an idea of what the book is about. And then on the back side um, has the message notes for today. Now, what, what makes the Old Testament a little bit difficult at times is, is the Old Testament for the most part, definitely the prophets, the minor prophets, they're not in chronological order. And that can be frustrating because we're like, I thought I already read that and I thought that already happened and I thought I read it in a several books before and, and, uh, and so that can get confusing, it can get frustrating. The, the section we're entering into right now is we're moving from the major prophets, we're going into the minor prophets section and again, the difference between the major prophets and the minor prophets is just simply the size of the book, not the importance of the content. The major prophets are larger books. The minor prophets are smaller books like the one we're gonna look at today. And so what we did in your notes today is that we put the minor prophets in chronological order for you. So it just kind of gives you a little bit of an idea. Um, It helps you kind of follow along with the story. Um, And theologians have no idea why they're not in chronological order in the Bible. They really don't know. And so it's a mystery, but we did the work for you. Um, So... Those of you that are married, or those of you that have ever been married, or maybe been in a long-term relationship or whatever, but specifically marriage, you know that marriage, is my wife in this service? (laughs) Let me choose my words wisely. I think she was in the first service. Marriage can be challenging, right? You know that. Marriage can be challenging. Really, do we need to talk? (laughs) Marriage can be challenging under optimal circumstances, right? When everything is going good, marriage can be challenging. And you know this, there are ups and downs, there's give and take, there's compromise after compromise, there's sometimes you're right, sometimes the other person's right. Um, Marriage can be really difficult. And those are under the best of circumstances. Sometimes our expectations are are way too high on that other person and and we have to lower our expectations and just let them be who they are. And and, and, but we 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 know this marriage can be really, really challenging. It can't under perfect circumstances. But we all know, and we say this a lot of time, a lot of times around here, there are no perfect relationships because there are no what? Perfect people. No such thing as a perfect marriage, no such thing as a perfect relationship because there's no such thing as a perfect person. And inevitably in a relationship, in a marriage specifically, you're gonna come across bumps in the road, difficulties. There are gonna be times where you have to forgive your spouse of things and just move on. 
And there's times when your spouse is gonna have to forgive you and just move on, right? If you're gonna last, if you're gonna make it, you have to go through the good times and the difficult times, right? So when we think of like, what is the worst thing we could ever do to our spouse? De well, yeah, that's one. But one of the things that we would make it, one of the most difficult things to overcome in a marriage is infidelity. There, there, there is no doubt. That, that ranks near the top of the list of like worst things you could ever do to your spouse is be unfaithful. That pain, that betrayal, that hurt, that torture, it is really difficult to make a marriage work after that. It happens, but it takes a very special person that can forgive and overcome and take that person back and give them another chance. We see that as kind of like, that's the worst of the worst. The book we're gonna look at today is called Hosea. Find it in your Old Testament, the book of Hosea. It's a small book, but it packs a powerful punch. And God uses Hosea and his marriage and his children as an example to the nation of Israel. And let me just sum up the story for you really quick. God asks Hosea to marry a woman that struggles with morality. Now I know the text says that she's already a prostitute, but the original text says that she has more of a tendency towards that kind of stuff. Hosea marries her. His wife leaves him and the children, goes into adultery, becomes a prostitute and is eventually sold into sexual slavery. And God uses his marriage as an example of what his people are doing to him. God's people have committed spiritual adultery by leaving God, by abandoning their values and by worshiping idols. Does that make sense? But it doesn't stop there. God asked Hosea to go and find his wife, to run after his wife, to not give up on her. And this is to be an example to the nation of Israel that God is on an endless pursuit for you. No matter what you do, even if you commit the worst of the worst, God is gonna come after you. God isn't gonna leave you where you are. God is gonna run after you. And so God tells Hosea to go find his wife. Not only is he to find his wife, he is to purchase her because she's been sold. She, 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 she's under somebody else's direction. She does this for a living. She's paid. So he has to go and purchase his wife. There's a theological term for that in the Bible that we hear a lot about, and it's the term redeem or redemption. It means that that has been purchased, there's been a price that has been paid in order to bring that person back. Hosea finds his wife, he redeems her, and he brings her back into the home. He is to forgive her and to love her just as before. Hosea has a difficult task. Now this is to be an example to God's people that even though you've ran away from me, even though you've gone way off the path, and even though you've committed spiritual adultery on me, not only am I gonna run after you and I'm gonna find you, but I'm gonna redeem you. Not only right now, but eventually through Jesus Christ, because of his death on the cross, I'm gonna redeem all of mankind and I'm gonna bring you back home where you belong. This is a beautiful book. It's a beautiful story. It packs a massive punch, but it is a beautiful story. Let's look at the historical context. So Hosea is a minor prophet. He is prophesying to the north. Remember, after Solomon died, there was a civil war in Israel. It divided. You have the northern half, which was called, do you remember? Israel, right? And its headquarters was uh, Samaria. And then you have the southern half that was called, do you remember? We looked at it last week, Judah. And its headquarters was Jerusalem. So you have the north and the south. Um, Hosea is called to the north. And remember, the north had 20 monarchs and none of them were good. They were all evil. And so Hosea is a prophet 
to this area that has left God, they've abandoned God. It is really the worst of the worst. They're doing the worst thing that they could ever do to God. And yet there's still hope. And God uses Hosea to bring this message. And you'll see this term in this book, Ephraim. And that is just another term for Israel. Remember, there were the 12 tribes of Israel. And during the separation, there were 10 tribes that went to the north, two that went to the south, and the biggest of the tribes of the north was Ephraim. So you'll see that word Ephraim, it just means Israel, it's the north. It's, a, it's an interchangeable term. And so Hosea is called to the, to the north. The northern kingdom would eventually be defeated by the Assyrians, and this is what Hosea is prophesying about, that judgment is coming. We looked at last week where Judah was conquered by the Babylonians, but it's in reverse order because we know the north was conquered first by the Assyrians, and then 136 years later, the south was conquered by the Babylonians, and so it seems like it hasn't happened yet, but in chronological view, it already has happened. Does that make sense? So, so, so he is prophesying to the north. And he prophesies for 40 to 50 years. Now, we've talked about this, okay? God does bring judgment on them. The Assyrians will conquer them. In the south, Ju Judah will be conquered by the Babylonians. But remember, these prophets are lifesavers. That's why we're doing this little series about lifesavers. They are lifesavers. God doesn't just say, you messed up, you blew it, I'm done with you. God gives them plenty of runway. In the south, he gave Isaiah and Jeremiah who prophesied for a combined nearly 90 years. And here we have Hosea who's prophesying 40 to 50 years. He's warning them, judgment is coming. There's time to turn around. There's time to repent. So God isn't just having a bad day and decides to judge them. God has given them ample opportunity to reverse course to change, to repent, and they refuse. So God uses the prophet Isaiah and his wife, his entire family, his children, to be an example to the nation of Israel of what it feels like to be betrayed. I think we forget this, and let me say this and then we'll move on to the book, that I think we oftentimes don't think about this, that when we hurt or when we run away from God, when we... Um, don't live in God's will, when we sin, when we run from God, I don't think we realize that it, that it hurts God. We know that when we do something to somebody else that it hurts them, but it breaks God's heart when his children run from him. It breaks God's heart. And we see that portrayed here in, um, in this book. Hosea had probably one of the most difficult jobs of any prophet to do this. Now, we've had some heavy hitters the last few weeks with some of the content and the books. Today's gonna be very encouraging. And here's why, and I want you to write this down. It's not in your notes, but I want you to write it in your Bible, write it in your notes, write it on your phone. I don't care where you write it, write it on the person's arm sitting next to you, I don't care. And here's this, this is what I want you to get from this book. God will do whatever it takes to capture your heart. God will do whatever it takes to capture your heart. God loves you. God is on an endless pursuit for your attention and for your devotion. And God does not give up. We give up on people. God does not give up. So let's look at three lifesavers from the book of Hosea. The first one is this, and it's in your notes, that God pursues us even when we're running from him. Have you ever ran from God before? Most of us have. And yet God runs after us. Look in chapter one, verse one, it says, the Lord gave these messages to Hosea, the son of Barry, during the years of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah were the kings of Judah, that's the south, and Jeroboam, the son of Joash, was the king of Israel, that's the north. When the Lord first began speaking to Israel through Hosea, he said to him, go and marry a prostitute. Again, in the original text, it's more like somebody that has a tendency towards this. She wasn't a prostitute yet. 
some of her children will be born to you from other men. So not only is he gonna have to forgive her, but he's also gonna raise children that are biologically not his. This will illustrate the way my people have been untrue to me, openly committing adultery against the Lord by worshiping other gods. So that's what he's talking about. They're committing spiritual uh, adultery by committing idolatry. So Hosea married Gomer. That should have been his first clue, right? The things weren't quite right. You guys awake here, right? Nobody's named Gomer, right? Okay. She became pregnant and gave Hosea a son. So we know that this first one is Hosea's. The Lord said, name the child Jezreel, for I'm about to punish King Jehu's dynasty to avenge the murders he committed at Jezreel. In fact, I will put an end to the independence by breaking its military power in the Jezreel Valley. Soon, Gomer became pregnant again and gave birth to a daughter. And the Lord said to Hosea, name your daughter Loruhamah, not loved, for I will no longer show love to the people of Israel or forget or or forgiving, forgive them. But I, the Lord, their God, will show love to the people of Judah, which is the South, right? I will personally free them from their enemies and will help, um, help them from weapons or from armies. We know that there was some righteousness in the South, so God spared them for a time, but they would eventually be conquered as well. After, Goma, after Gomer had weaned Lurahami, she again became pregnant and gave birth to a second son. And the Lord said, name him Loami, not my people. For Israel is not my people and I am not their God. Yet the time will come when Israel will prosper and become a great nation. And that day, the people will be like the sands of the seashore, too many to count. In other words, God said, even though you've gone so far, there is always hope. And that's the message of this book that God pursues us even when we're running from him. So God would use his wife, Gomer, as an illustration of how bad God is hurt. Hosea is gonna feel this firsthand of what it feels like to be betrayed, to what it feels like to be left, to what it feels like to be cheated on. Hosea is gonna feel that. And he's gonna understand firsthand what God feels like. In chapter three, verse one, Hosea says, the Lord said to me, go and love your wife again. His wife goes off. She does all of this, commits adultery, becomes a prostitute. And God says, go love your wife again. Even though she commits adultery with another lover, this will illustrate that the Lord still loves Israel. Even though the people have turned to other gods and love to worship them. God is saying, Hosea, I want you to be an example of who I am. Just as my people have left me, I love them and I'm gonna go find them. I want you to go find your wife and love her again. Verse two, chapter three. So I bought her back for 15 pieces of silver and about five bushels of barley and a measure of wine. Then I said to her, you must live in my house for many days and stop your prostitution. During the time, you will not have sexual intercourse with anyone, not even with me. This illustrates that Israel will be a long time without a king or a prince or without sacrifices in the temple, priests, and even idols. But afterwards, the people will return to the Lord their God, to David's descendants, their king, and they will come trembling in awe to the Lord, and the Lord will receive his good gifts in the last days. God says, Hosea, I want you to go find your wife. I want you to bring her back. And that's gonna be an example that even though my people have strayed from me and even though they've ran far from me, I'm gonna never stop running after them. I'm gonna pursue them and I'm gonna go after them. It's an incredible story of redemption. He redeems his wife, he brings her back. And this is such an amazing example of God pursuing us. You know, the Bible talks about Jesus has redeemed us. That even though we've ran far from God, that God has ransomed us. In Revelation chapter five, it's talking about Jesus. It says that he was slaughtered and that his blood has ransomed his people for God. Speaking of Jesus, his death redeemed us on the cross. First Peter chapter one says, for you know that God paid a ransom to save you 
from the empty life that you inherited from your ancestors. And it was not paid with mere gold and silver, which lose their value, but it was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless lamb of God. God chose him as a ransom long before the world began, but now these days has been revealed for your sake. Isn't that amazing? That even when we run from God, that God redeems us because of what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. And this is to be an illustration, Hosea's wife, that when we worship anyone or anything else other than God, that it is considered in God's eyes, spiritual adultery. And then his son is to be an example as well. His son means to be, his son's name, Jezreel, means to scatter. And the idea is this, you have scattered your devotion all over. You do not worship me, you do not live for me, you do not serve me, you've abandoned me, your mindset is scattered, you're not focused on me, you're scattered. And so that's the idea. And the idea is this, is that when Israel sinned against God, they were scattered. They didn't care about focusing on God. They are focused on everything except God. And the same thing happens to us. When we are not living in God's will, a lot of times life becomes really murky to us. But when we're doing our best to live for God, we, we have a lot much better focus. And then Hosea's daughter is to be an example as well. Her name means no mercy. In other words, when we sin, that sin, when we cheat on God, there's gonna be consequences no matter who we are. And even though they've gone years and even decades violating God, a time of reckoning is coming. And God wants them to understand through this illustration that there are always consequences of sin, no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, we'll see that even the spiritual leaders who have abandoned God will be judged as well. And then Hosea's second son, Loami, his name means not my people. And the idea is this, you are not acting like your identity. Remember, the Jews were to be different. They were to be set apart. They were to be holy like God. God gave them spiritual laws, ceremonial laws, physical laws, eating laws. God wanted them to stand out from all the pagan nations that surrounded them. But they didn't do that. They were acting like everybody else around them. And so God is saying, you've lost your identity. You're not living in your purpose. You're not living in the identity that I created you to be. They've lost their identity. When Israel committed spiritual adultery on God, they weren't following the commandments. They weren't following any of the laws that God had set apart for them. Yet they're running from God and yet God is still on an endless pursuit for them. The second lifesaver that we see from this book is that God loves us even when we are at our worst. We see this in chapters four through seven. You see, this might surprise you, but God doesn't love you because of how good you are. Did you know that? And God doesn't love me because I'm a pastor. And God doesn't love you because of how long you've been a Christian or how devoted you are to him. God doesn't love you only when you're at your best. God doesn't love you only when things are going perfect and you're reading your Bible and going to church and doing all the things that God asks us to do. God doesn't just love you when you're batting a thousand. God loves you even when you feel unlovable. And God wants his people to understand this through Hosea, who loves his wife, even though she did the worst thing she could ever do to him, God wants us to to know and wants his people to know that God doesn't just love us when we're at our best, that God loves us when we're at our worst. How hard is it? How difficult is it to find somebody that will love you no matter what? That will love you even when you're not perfect and loves even when there's flaws and difficulties? Anybody can find somebody to love them when they're at their best, but how difficult is it to find somebody that loves you unconditionally, even through all of the junk in your life? God says, that's who I am. I love you when you feel unlovable. I love you when you've ran as far as you could go. I love you when you've done the absolute unthinkable. Romans 5.8 tells us that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. And what that means is that Jesus knew that we had sinned. Jesus knew that we were gonna continue to sin. 
And yet knowing all of that, he still chose to die for us. God has entered into a covenant of love with us. And believe it or not, there is nothing that you can do right now that will cause God to love you any more than God loves you right at this moment. Just the opposite is true as well. There is nothing that you could ever do, according to the Bible, that would cause God to love you any less than God loves you right now. Isn't that amazing? There is nothing that you can do that will separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. God loves us even when we're at our worst. Look at the charges. Look at the things that Israel had done. Turn to chapter four. Hear the word of the Lord, O people of Israel. Verse one, the Lord has filed a lawsuit against you. Here's the charges. Here are the horrible things that they've done. And yet God still loves them the same. Look what God says. There is no faithfulness, no kindness, no knowledge of God in your land. Could you believe that? These are the Jewish people, God's people. And there's no knowledge of God. God says, there is no faithfulness, no kindness, no no none, zero. I mean, that's rock bottom. That's about as bad as it can get. You curse and you lie and you kill and you steal and you commit adultery. There's violence everywhere with one murder after another. This is why your land is not producing and it's filled with sadness and all the living things are becoming sick and dying and even the animals and the birds and the fish. And then in verse four, God says, they're blaming other people. He says, don't point the finger at anybody else. This is your responsibility. This is your sin. They had stopped growing spiritually. Look what it says. It says that they had no knowledge of God at all. Isn't that amazing? That's how bad things have gotten. They don't even acknowledge God anymore. The second charge against them, we see in verse one and two as well. They stopped pursuing righteousness. Look what it says. It says, there's no faithfulness. There's no kindness, not a little bit. There's none. There is no faithfulness. There's no kindness at all. They weren't even taking responsibility for their actions. The third charge against them, we see in verse six. My people are being destroyed because they don't know me. It is all your fault, you priests. For you yourselves refuse to know me. Even the spiritual leaders were far from God. Now I refuse to recognize you as my priests since you have forgotten the laws of your God. They stopped pursuing God. Look in verse 11. You're, you're gonna love verse 11. Alcohol and prostitution have robbed my people of their brains. I love the Bible. Listen to this. They are asking a piece of wood to tell them what to do. He's talking about the idolatry. They, they, they would make these fake images, these, the, the, these false images, and they would pray to them. And God is saying, are you absolutely crazy? Like, are you a lunatic? You have gotten so bad that you're at a place where you are praying to a piece of wood for direction. This is how jacked up you are. You literally are asking wood what to do. Think, they think that a stick can tell them the future. Longing after idols and making them fool has made them foolish. They played the prostitute, serving other gods and deserting their God. They offer sacrifices and idols on top of mountains. They go up into the hills and burn incense. In the pleasant shades of the oaks and the poplars and other trees, God says, you guys are out of your stinking mind. Like you literally think a stick is going to help you and yet you won't turn to me. They stop pursuing God altogether. In chapter five, verse 15, we see the goal of this judgment coming upon them. Then I will return to my place until they admit their guilt, look to me for help. For as soon as trouble comes, they will search for me. This is always the desired goal and discipline. Sometimes God will allow us to hit rock bottom because only then oftentimes is when that gets our attention. And we finally look up to God and say, God, I need you. And guess where God's at? right there with you. 
That's an incredible message. The last lifesaver that we see is that God wants to bring us home even when we're far from him. Chapters eight through 14. Even though God's people have wandered way off the path, and even though they've stopped loving God and stopped pursuing God, God promises to bring them home. Just like Hosea went and found his wife, forgave her, redeemed her, God will do the same for his people. And we know that that happened, that they ended up going back to the land of Israel and rebuilding the walls and rebuilding the temple. And God allowed them to be redeemed. Look in chapter 14, verse four says, the Lord says, I will heal you of your idolatry and your, faithful, and your faithlessness. And my love will know no bounds for my anger will be gone forever. And I will be to Israel like a refreshing dew from heaven. I will, it will blossom like the lily and I will send deep roots deep into the soil, the cedars of Lebanon and its branches will spread out like those beautiful olive trees as a fragrant as a forest of Lebanon. God says, you know what? Even though judgment's coming and you're gonna suffer the consequences of, of your sin, I'm not finished with you yet because God wants to bring us home even when we are far from him. Chapter eight through 10, we see judgment is coming. He tells them in chapter eight to sound the alarm. They've sown the wind. They're gonna reap the whirlwind. In chapters 11 through 14, we see that God is on this endless pursuit and God tells him in chapter 11, verse eight, he says, how can I let you go? How can I destroy you or demolish you? My heart is torn within me and my compassion overflows. This is such a beautiful message that even though we're far from God, God wants to bring us home. Have you ever, have you ever lost something valuable to you and went on an endless search to find it? Anybody? Anybody ever lost something? Oh my gosh, it's horrible. Have you ever lost a kid? <laughs> or the kid wandered off in the mall or a store or even in your house, they're hiding somewhere. Your heart, 30 seconds feel, yeah, I've been there. I've lost my son before. I, when he was young, he, I didn't lose him. He wandered off, but I guess I lost him. But it is, it is a horrible, that sinking feeling, man. 30 seconds feels like, 30 hours, right? It is horrible. It just, oh my gosh, it's gut-wrenching when you lose something valuable or you lose, it's horrible. That's how we feel when we lose something tangible. And that's how God feels when we wander off and when we are far from the Lord. The Bible says this in 2 Peter 3, 9, that the Lord is not slow about his promises as some count slowness, but is patient towards you not willing that anyone should perish, but that all might come to repentance. This is not just a message for us. This is a message for every single person that God wants to bring us home, that God loves us, that God loves you. And a lot of times we write people off and we say, well, that person will never turn to God or that person will never come to the Lord. Or we write people off because we say, well, they're living this kind of lifestyle or they're doing that and we give up on them. But guess what? God never gives up on them, ever, never. The moment they look to God, God has been there the entire time, no matter how far they have run. Um, at the church that I planted in Arizona, when we were smaller, we used to do this thing every year called Family Day at the Lake. We'd, get a, we'd have people that had boats and jet skis and we'd bring food and cook out. And this is when our church was smaller. And, and we'd have, you know, a couple hundred people there and we'd, you know, boat and jet ski, just have a great day. Family day at the lake. It was so awesome. We had a great time. And, and do, you guys, do you guys remember when like platinum was like really expensive and everybody wanted platinum rings and platinum necklaces and, and all that? Well, this guy that went to our church, he had a platinum wedding ring. And he had come up out of the water one time, you know, we're throwing footballs, doing all kinds of stuff in the water and his ring was missing. It was gone. And he was begging, can somebody help me find the ring? Can his wife was not there. And so 
it was gonna be a day of reckoning when he got home if he didn't find that ring. About a hundred of us stopped everything that we were doing and we were you know, going under the water, searching, looking everywhere for that ring. I mean, we were, I felt so horrible for him. We all felt terrible for him. He was, he was a mess trying to find that ring. We never found it, never found it. An expensive ring, never, his wedding ring, never found it. If us as people, if our heart can feel compassion and our heart can sink for somebody that loses something, how do you think God feels about his people, his precious souls that he created that wander far from him? And I know we like to label people and put titles on people, they're this or they're this or they're that, and we give up on people and we say they are beyond hope for God. Like, how dare we say that? Because the way that we might feel for somebody that loses something or we lose something ourselves, this is how God feels when his people wander off the path. And God will do everything he can to bring them back. Everything he can to bring them back. We know this because Jesus, who's God in the flesh, gave us three illustrations, three stories in Luke chapter 15 about three lost items. And this is to be an illustration of the character of God because Jesus was God in the flesh. This is God's heart. Jesus tells the first story in, in Luke chapter 15 about a shepherd who has a hundred sheep and one of the sheep wanders off. Do you remember what that shepherd does? The shepherd leaves the 99 and searches everywhere to go find that one lost sheep. That's the character of God. He tells another, another story in the same chapter of a woman who lost a coin. And she looks under her rugs and she moves her couch and she sweeps and does everything she can to find that one lost coin. She looks everywhere that she can. This is the heart of God. And then he tells another story of a person whose son wandered off left, took his inheritance and wasted his life. And we know that the father every single day was looking for that son to return home. And one day he finally does. And when that son comes, the father's already been looking. He runs out. He doesn't beat him up. He doesn't gripe at him. He doesn't nag him to death. You know what he does? He runs out, meets him where he's at, embraces him and then throws a party. For my son that has been lost has been found. This is the heart of God. Listen, listen to me. And this is the story of this book. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, you are never too far that God cannot reach out his hand and lift you out of whatever difficult circumstances you're in. It doesn't matter what you've done, how far away from God you are. It doesn't matter. All that matters is that God wants you home. And that message is not just for us. You probably have people in your life that maybe other people have given up on, maybe you've given up on, and you say, there is no hope. There is always hope. Do you know why? Because we serve a God that will leave the 99 and go look for the one. A God that will look under every nook and cranny to find the one coin. A God that will go and do whatever he has to do to bring that lost child back. That's the God that we serve. God loves you. This is how valuable you are to God. And just as Hosea pursued his wife when she ran, we have a God who forgives us of the unforgivable and loves us when we're unlovable. If Hosea can do that for his wife, God can do that for us. Many times we say, oh, I found religion or I found God. No, you didn't. God has been looking for you the whole time. God is on an endless pursuit for you. And God loves you in all your junk in all the sin, in all the waywardness, God loves you and has an amazing plan. And the goal is to restore your life. That's the God we serve. Father, thank you so much for this beautiful message of Hosea. 
Matter of fact, the last two chapters of this book are all about redemption, restoration, and forgiveness. And God, I pray for each person here today. Maybe there's somebody in this room that thinks that they've done too much, they've went too far, that they're beyond your love and your reach. God, I pray that today they understand that that is never the case. That is not the God that we serve. We serve a God who loves us with compassion and who's ready to bring us back the minute we look to you. And God, there might be people in this room that have family, friends, coworkers, neighbors, acquaintances that maybe people have given up on say, oh, there's no hope for them. God, help us to not believe that. Help us not to illustrate that in our lives. But help us to know that just as you love us, you love that person. And just as you want us back home, you want them back home. And God, sometimes you put those strategic relationships in our life to help us to point people towards you. And so God, just as you don't give up on people, I pray that we don't give up on people either. That's why we have church. That's why we do what we do is to help people understand this incredible message of redemption. We pray these things in Jesus' name and amen.